In the West, faced with the growing pandemic, most epidemiologists favoured a strict lockdown. And that was based on a key study of the 1919 to 1920 Spanish flu epidemic, which showed that cities in the United States that had enforced a very strict lockdown did save lives. But is this study actually relevant to a new virus with very different age groups at risk? Could it be that that Spanish flu of a century ago was helped by lockdown because it hit all age groups, including the young? Well, COVID-19, of course, is much more damaging to older groups and lockdown might even encourage more contact with those who are at risk. Well, a fascinating and very, very current question, which we'll be exploring tonight at How the Light Gets In, in a virtual sense, of course, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me introduce our speakers. First, Shunetra Gupta, who is a novelist and professor of theoretical epidemiology at the University of Oxford. She's recently been in the news for her criticism of the wide acceptance of Professor Neil Ferguson's Imperial College Group's paper, which recommended a strict lockdown to combat the coronavirus. And then we have Professor Hugh Montgomery, who is Chair of Intensive Medicine at University College London and Director of the UCL Institute for Human Health and Performance. He's also conducted research on Everest. He's run three ultra marathons, skydived naked for charity, and holds the world record for playing piano underwater. So I think tonight's discussion should be something of a breeze. And then we have Sir David Spiegelhalter, the Winton Professor of the Public Understanding of Risk at the University of Cambridge. With David's background in medical statistics, he has recently become, I think it's fair to say, one of the, if not the UK's leading voice in interpreting the data of coronavirus. My name is Rana Mitter. I'm a presenter of BBC's Free Thinking Programme on Radio 3 and the Arts and Ideas podcast, and it's a real pleasure to be hosting tonight. So first of all, we're going to be asking each of our three speakers to give us up to three minutes of thought on the question of what does the risk of COVID really mean, or the risk from COVID really mean? And I'm going to turn first, if I may, to you, Shanetra. What does the risk from COVID really mean? What does the risk mean? I think that, um, I mean, obviously there is the risk to the individual and the risk to the society. And one of the important elements, which you've already mentioned, that hasn't really come across, it seems to me, in the debate um, concerning the implementation of lockdown, is who, is pr who precisely is vulnerable, both, not, uh, both to the disease itself and to the effects of lockdown. So I think in terms of risk, that there is a sort of somewhat um, one-dimensional perception of risk, which is the risk of disease. Whereas in fact, what we should be weighing up are the risks and the costs of both of the processes, the process of disease and the process of lockdown. Impressively concise, thank you. I, I should say that the risk from COVID is the wider overarching framework we've been given to, to talk about the, uh, the debate. But of course, the question of whether we should have gone to lockdown is very central, uh, central to that. So let me lead off from that, if I may, to turn to our next speaker, Professor Hugh Montgomery. Hugh, um, I mean, what do you see as important to that question of assessing risk from COVID and the question that Shanetra put to us, should we have gone into lockdown? Okay, so I'll give you my personal views. They are entirely personal. So what does the risk of uh, coronavirus mean to me? Well, the first thing is we need to differentiate risk and hazard. And I think the next speaker will address that maybe much better than I can. But, but my experience of dealing with medicine is that people are very, very poor at differentiating those two things, integrating them. So dealing um, with those, we need to differentiate the risk and the hazard, but we also need to differentiate those in terms of whether they're direct, i.e. whether that risk or hazard is to me, or whether it is by my actions to someone else. We need to think whether those are immediate risks, so that perhaps whether I live or die now, or whether they're delayed, in other words, the societal impact of the economic changes we put in place may damage us or others, and indeed whether those risks are therefore personal or societal. And uh, my comments that follow are really coloured by my experience in the last nine weeks of um, a fair battering, it's fair to say, of looking after coronavirus patients in hospital and intensive care, and my experience of, of healthcare in the last 36 years. So dealing with the hazard first, the hazard, let us not underestimate it, it is absolutely catastrophic. This disease is unlike anything I've seen before. It isn't just a bit of pneumonia. It isn't getting a little bit short of oxygen. 
our patients have encephalitis, brain death, stroke, um, fits and seizures, they have muscle wasting, they have lung disease, they have heart impacts, they have liver problems, they have kidney failure. Um, half of the patients we put on intensive care die and the other half are very, very badly battered and will take a long, long time to recover. So the hazard here is very substantial and that's not even dealing with the um, moral impacts and the emotional impacts to staff and indeed on the families who are often uh, separated from their loved ones for a length, great length of time. In terms of dealing with the risk, we are beginning to understand what that risk might be, but we're still not certain of the data about quite how many people are infected to get how many with symptoms. But it looks from the best of my understanding, that around 76% of people who contract this disease will have either no symptoms at all, or really very mild or limited symptoms indeed. So it's the 25% of the people who get it, or the 20%, that become ill and it seems that perhaps five to ten percent of those go to hospital and maybe one percent of cases or one in 120 uh, will go to ITU and half will die. So the personal risk um, across a population is very small indeed but the risk of course differs um, if depending on the environment in which you work, whether you're poor which we've heard a great deal about, and, and that is definitely uh, the case, whether you're male, uh, I am in a risk group, whether you're hypertensive, diabetic, you have a coronary disease, and so forth. So the risk is very much greater for some others. Um, the next bit though, is to think about the risk to other people, and this famous business of the R number. In other words, how many people you infect if you have it. And we started off with an R of around three to 3.6 abroad. And it's worth pointing out therefore, that means that if I get it, and I give it to three others, that's four. If they each give it to three others, that's 13. And by the time you get to the 10th cycle, um, 88,573 people have had the disease, which means that around 220 people will end up on an intensive care unit. So this business of us being careful about transmission matters because of those. Finally then, the question of how we mitigate those risks and hazards. Well, I suppose there was a choice. Wuhan could have locked down aggressively at the very beginning so that this thing was extinguished at source. And that's long gone, that didn't happen. We could, I suppose, have a global travel lockdown almost immediately to stop the disease spreading through the air corridors and then have local lockdowns to try to extinguish the cases, i.e. by case, identifying the cases and locking them down. But we didn't do that either. We could have let it run. And we could just accept that the majority of people get mild to moderate disease, that there's a relatively small proportion who die from it, so we just accept that hit. That could have been done, or we could have locked countries down brick by brick, extinguished the disease, and then reopened. What we seem to have done is actually gone for a smouldering approach to try to lock it down to control the number of cases, and then lift the foot off the accelerator and let that steady stream of cases come in. But let's be clear, without herd immunity caused by uh, vaccination, or by long lasting immunity, which we don't know will exist, um, the same number of people will contract this disease and die. So um, that's largely true. There's some we can mitigate that small number by admission of an intensive care unit. So finally, just to deal with the risks of that approach, and uh, again, our first speaker can deal with if this. I, if I could just um, to bring you to a, a conclusion here. Yeah, um, the, the, risk then, carry on the, discussion. the risk The risk then is the economic damage. Um, this is, savage and we know that 42 percent of ill health in this country is preventable and it's generally the poor and those that have unequal distribution of access to health care that are most affected so there are risks to the approach that we've taken so that's where i shall stop thanks very much and where be where you stop it just before we stop for the moment and you'll be coming right back into the discussion very very shortly but not before we have turned to david spiegelhalter david this question on risk and how we should assess it really seems to be at the heart of our discussion tonight. Yeah. Could I ask you to give us two or three minutes on your yeah. thoughts on that question? Well, you know, as the other, you know, my, my colleagues have, have, have said, uh, this is really complex and I'm supposed to be an expert on risk communication and things like this. This is the most challenging area I think I've ever had to deal with. Um, it, even what the terms mean, you know, this, the risk, I, like, I think it's, I like the question, the risk of COVID, because that can mean it's so ambiguous, you know, as, as you said, to whom? The risk to you or the risk to society? Um, as Shanitra said, the, is it, uh, you know, risks just in terms of dying from COVID, which is only one aspect 
of this whole you know thing we're in at the moment, and um, and and way in which the the benefits, the potential benefits and harms of alternative policies are very very complex. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.